Hi, my name is Dylan Huff. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University, and I'm presenting on Clockwork, resource-efficient static scheduling for multi-rate image processing applications on FPGAs. And this is joint work with Steve Dye at NVIDIA and Pat Hanrahan at Stanford. So what are multi-rate image processing algorithms? Well, they're directed acyclic graphs of sliding window operators. And sliding window operators are operations like the one shown on the right, where a fixed size window of pixels, in this case, a three by three window shown in red, is passed to a function or kernel to produce an output pixel, and then slid over by a fixed stride, in this case, a stride of three, and the window is applied to the next window of pixels to produce the next pixel in the output image. And this process is repeated over and over again, sliding the window over the entire image to produce an output. Now, a sliding window algorithm is uni-rate if all operators have stride one in all dimensions. On the other hand, an image processing algorithm is multi-rate if at least one operator has stride not equal to one in at least one dimension. So for example, on the right, the operation, the algorithm is multi-rate because the operation we're looking at has both row and column stride of three. And this very simple model of computation is expressive enough to describe many algorithms for edge detection, exposure fusion, demosaicing, image blending, and other important image processing applications. So to put code in your head for these applications, here are three one-dimensional examples of the three most common kinds of sliding window operations, stencils, upsamples, and downsamples. In a stencil, in this case, we take a two by one window and we produce an output pixel, and then we step over by one to produce the next output pixel, so that up to conditions at the boundary, the output is the same size as the input. In an upsample, each application of the computation to a two by one window of the input produces multiple pixels of the output, and in a for loop, this corresponds to having a fractional stride. And then a downsample has a stride that is larger than one, which corresponds to the window stepping over and skipping potential output windows, producing an output that's smaller than the input. Multi-rate image processing algorithms can benefit tremendously from hardware acceleration because they have predictable memory accesses, high locality, and large amounts of data reuse. And as a result, they can get order of magnitude speedups on custom accelerators compared to CPUs and GPUs. Unfortunately, there's a problem, which is that what image processing experts write tends to look like what's shown on this slide, which is a toy example of an image processing application where we read in a 64 by 64 image and brighten it by multiplying every pixel value by two. And then we blur the image and create a smaller downsampled image by averaging together two by two squares of the brightened image. And this whole algorithm is expressed as a sequence of loop nests that operate on images stored as multidimensional arrays. On the other hand, what hardware architects would design for an application like this would be like the data flow architecture I've shown on the right, where streams of pixels flow across processing elements that implement each stage, and the data is carried from one processing element to another in specialized high bandwidth reuse buffers called line buffers. So how do we bridge this gap between high level imperative specifications of image processing algorithms and low level efficient hardware implementations? Well, it's a large gap. On the left, we have languages like C++ and Halide, where algorithm designers can give untimed software descriptions of image processing algorithms. And on the right, we have languages like Verilog, where hardware designers can give cycle-accurate descriptions of a data flow architecture for the same algorithm. There have been many compilers designed to fill this gap, but only the one that we're presenting on in this work can statically schedule large multi-rate algorithms. So Clockwork is the first compiler of its kind that can statically schedule large, realistic, multi-rate image processing algorithms. And what it does is it unrolls and fuses an input program into HLS C++ for an accelerator at the target throughput. So the user passes in a program like the one we see on the left, which is the example we were just looking at, together with a throughput target, which says that we want an accelerator that can implement this application consuming two pixels of input every clock cycle. Clockwork then unrolls all of the loop nests as necessary to reach the target throughput, optimizes internal reuse buffers into shift registers or line buffers, converts the inputs and outputs into streams, and fuses together the entire application into a single loop nest that can be pipelined to an initiation interval of one. And it does this using a restricted scalable form of polyhedral scheduling that can handle sliding window operations very efficiently. And the way it does this should be familiar to experts on polyhedral analysis, which is that it proceeds from the outside of the loop nest in the application inward, first abstracting away all of the inner loops into operations that instantaneously produce rows of the image. So for example, our original application would become two loop nests, a first for loop that iterates 64 times and on each iteration produces the rth row of the brightened image, and then a second loop nest which iterates 32 times and on each iteration produces the rth row of the output and consumes two rows of the brightened image. 
Clockwork then examines each of these operations to find the most restrictive data dependency for each stage. So for example, the first stage has no data dependencies other than the input, which we assume is always available. And the second stage has a dependency on the 2R plus one throw of the brightened image. Then Clockwork turns these most restrictive data dependencies into synchronous data flow style constraints on the execution rates and delays of statements. So for example, in this statement or in this constraint formulation, QP and QC are the relative firing rates of P and C. They're how often they execute inside of the fused loop nest and DP and DC are the start delays of the P and C statements inside the fused loop nest. So you can think of them as the number of iterations that elapse before each of the operations starts inside the final fused loop nest. And so we assemble all of these constraints for each stage into a constraint solving problem, find the optimal solution, and infer a schedule for the row production of all of the images that are produced in this image processing algorithm. And you can see um, a pipeline diagram of the schedule on the right, where we first produce the zero throw of BR, then we simultaneously produce the one throw of BR and the zero throw of the output, and so on and so on, until uh, all rows of the input and output uh, have been processed. However, listeners might notice that in this abstract schedule, the entire row of an image is produced instantaneously, which is not realistic for large images, and also output row zero is produced at the same logical time step as Brighton row one, even though actually many of the pixels in output row zero depend on pixels inside of Brighton row one because the output row depends on the top two pixels of the brightened output since it's a downsample by two. So how do we handle this? Well, the answer is we go into the next level of the loop and compute an even more fine-grained schedule for row production. So we unwrap the P and C statements and remind ourselves of what the loop nests inside that iterate over the columns of the intermediate values in the application do. Then we project away the row loop so that we're only looking at the column variables. And this is fine because of all, all of our operations uh, perform rectangular iterations on rectangular windows. And then we use the exact same procedure that I described for the rows to solve for a schedule at the target throughput, which is shown on the right. Once we've constructed a complete schedule, we use polyhedral code generation techniques to turn the schedule into an unrolled fused loop nest. We then generate HLS code for the schedule with uh, internal arrays converted into line buffers, loops elaborated into uh, syntax compliant C++ code, and a pipeline directive that tells the HLS tool to pipeline the loops to an initiation interval of one. So the question is, how high quality is the resulting accelerator? Well, we're going to evaluate our accelerators in two parts. First, we're going to compare uh, uni-ray applications performance, and then we're gonna look at multi-ray applications. So for our comparison on uh, uni-ray pipelines, we're gonna compare to a system called SODA, which was published at ICAD 2018. SODA is specialized for uni-ray pipelines. It doesn't support upsample and downsample, but for stencil pipelines, it produces theoretically optimal reuse buffer sizes, though it does make extensive use of ready valid channels, and it was a candidate for best paper at ICAD 2018. And we're going to compare four applications, a vertical blur followed by a horizontal blur, which has two stages, a Sobel edge detector, which has four stages, a camera pipeline, which has 10 stages and demosaics and unsharpens an image, and Jacobi iteration, which has 15 stages and is an iterative stencil computation. And in our comparison setup, we're gonna use a Xilinx Vertex 7 du 9 p which is a large FPGA with around 1.1 million LUTs. We're gonna target a clock of 250 megahertz, and for each application, we're going to generate variants that run at 1, 16, and 32 pixels per clock cycle. And what we see is that Clockwork uses on average 55% fewer LUTs, 30% fewer flip-flops, and 22% fewer BRAMs than SODA at the same throughput and clock target. So this grid of charts shows resource utilization for Blur, Camera Pipeline, and Sobel by SODA and Clockwork. Each column is one application that's labeled on the x-axis, and each uh, row is a resource category, flip-flops at the bottom, BRAMs in the middle, and LUTs at the top. We've omitted URAMs because neither SODA nor Clockwork make use of URAMs for any of these applications, and we've omitted DSPs because both, both uh, copies of the applications use the same number of DSPs for all instances. So at the same throughput target and all uh, instances of these applications met the throughput target and the clock target, what we see is that for small, shallow pipelines with low throughputs, the differences are very, very small. SODA and Clockwork, which SODA is the blue bars and Clockwork is the green bars, are very, very close. For example, at uh, you know, a blur application at one pixel per cycle. On the other hand, for deep pipelines with high throughputs, like uh, Jacobi running at 32 pixels per clock cycle, the differences in resource consumption are quite large, especially the LUT consumption, which uh, has a very pronounced difference.
Now for multi-rate applications, we're going to look at three different apps as tests. A max pooling, denoted MP, which has one stage and is a common DNN layer that downsamples two or three dimensions of an input tensor. Gaussian pyramid, an application with eight stages, denoted GP, which is a building block of other image processing algorithms that repeatedly blurs and downsamples an input image. And then synthetic exposure fusion, or SEF, which has 53 stages, which is a photo processing operation used in the Android HDR Plus camera pipeline. And it involves building two Gaussian pyramids, two Laplacian pyramids, doing a bunch of pointwise math, and then reconstructing uh, it, the resulting Gaussian pyramid, Laplacian pyramid, excuse me, into an image. And to the best of our knowledge, SEF is the largest application that's ever been automatically compiled from a architecture agnostic DSL for image processing all the way to an FPGA. And what we found when we looked for a comparison system is that there is no existing actively maintained system that can automatically compile multi-rate applications of this size and complexity. So Soda and Darkroom were not designed to support multi-rate applications. Aetherlink doesn't scale the pipelines with dozens of stages. Polymage FPGA is not publicly available. And after contacting the authors, we found that the source code no longer exists. Rigel and Halide HLS require manual FIFO sizing. HIPAC FPGA is no longer maintained. So instead, we're going to compare to auto-scheduled CPU and GPU implementations implemented in Halide. The CPU implementations were auto-scheduled using the Halide Master Branch Auto-Scheduler, and the GPU implementations were scheduled using a GPU uh, auto-scheduler published last year. So what we see on this chart is that energy efficiency of the FPGA accelerator scales better with pipeline depth than the CPUs or GPUs. So on the x-axis, we see max pooling, Gaussian pyramid, and synthetic exposure fusion. And on the y-axis, we have energy efficiency measured in gigapixels of input processed per joule of energy spent. Uh, the blue bar is clockwork, running at a target throughput of 32 pixels per clock cycle. The green bar is a V100 GPU, which is a large uh, data center GPU. The red line is the K80 GPU, which is a smaller, older GPU. And the purple bar is an 8-thread Intel CPU. Now, the red line at the top labeled clockwork theoretical peak is the theoretical max possible energy efficiency of a clockwork design. And this was calculated by taking the bandwidth of the PCI connection to the AWS F1 where the clockwork accelerator was running and dividing that bandwidth in pixels per second by the power consumption of the FPGA at rest. So it's the energy efficiency that Clockwork would get to if it could generate an accelerator that consumed the entire input bandwidth of the FPGA without adding any additional power consumption beyond what would be needed to turn the FPGA on. Now, what we found is that for shallow pipelines, large GPUs are unbeatable. So as you can see, the green line for the V100 GPU is actually above the theoretical peak energy efficiency that Clockwork could attain. On the other hand, as pipelines get deeper and the need to exploit pipeline parallelism to minimize uh, the number of memory accesses and parallelize the application goes up, uh, the FPGA starts to look better and better. And for deep pipelines, clockwork outperforms both CPUs and even large GPUs. And what you'll notice is that clockwork's theoretical peak or actual performance is actually quite uh, close to the theoretical peak, especially for uh, shallower pipelines. So in summary, Clockwork is scalable and resource efficient. It handles multi-rate applications fully automatically. It's competitive with state-of-the-art stencil compilers and with CPU and GPU implementations of the same algorithms. It's open source, and you can find it on GitHub at the link we've provided, and it targets industrial HLS tools. We hope that Clockwork is a valuable contribution to the hardware compilers research community, and we'd love to hear any questions or comments you have.